Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. This is your host, Mary Ann Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Karen Herrick, who's here to share with us, where did they go and are they okay? Karen finished her doctoral major at Union Institute and University. Her thesis entitled Naming Spiritual Experiences jump-started this research that she continues to this day. So welcome to the show, Karen Herrick. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your work. Why don't we start from the beginning? What even got you interested in spiritual psychology? Well, um, I grew up in an alcoholic family. My father was alcoholic. And um, we didn't have spirituality there. Uh, My mother was Catholic. My father was Protestant. So my father would take us to church our Sunday school and drop us off and then forget to pick us up. So church was always like, oh, God can't be interested in us. This is much of a mess. So in living in upstate New York, um, I think what started spirituality was I, I was interested in nature and it was beautiful where I lived. So I walked a lot in nature and decided something about, I didn't know the American Indians uh, believed that the wind, you know, was from spirit, but I had a feeling that the wind was had something to do with, um, with spirit, even though I didn't have the word spirit then. And um, then I got married and um, had children and uh, went to, I was raised Protestant, so went to the Methodist church and things like that. And then decided my husband was alcoholic and I had to leave the marriage. So I had to get divorced and decided I'd go back to college and um, because I had taken a few courses. And um, then um, I had a master's in social work at Rutgers, and they had an alcohol minor. So I started um, working with families of alcoholics and drug addicts and trying to teach them, you know, about codependency and um, how to, you know, make everybody stop living the denial of uh, the alcoholic family. And in that, you hear a lot of spiritual stories because alcoholics, whether they're drinking or not drinking, (laughs) They do have uh, many kinds of spiritual experiences. So I started hearing about them. And then I just became curious. And I got interested in Jungian psychology. And Carl Jung um, is a psychologist that I think is uh, very undervalued in our society here in America. His mother was psychic. And um, his grandfather also. And his grandfather had a second wife because his first wife was deceased. And he and his second wife at lunch would talk to his first wife on the other side. And that was the first indication I had that you could talk to, you know, dead people. Um, and the more I got interested in, in psychology, then I lived in California and we had psychics and mediums there and I would visit them and they would have all kinds of uh, weekend, you know, holistic weekends where you could talk to all these different kinds of people. So I was interested in that. <clears throat> but then to get back to my practice, um, people think I shouldn't live on the East Coast because I like all those you know, weird kind of things. But then weird people came to me with all these experiences. So they were telling me what happened to them and they would see their deceased father in their bedroom. And, and you know, we would just try to work it through. And all the time that I was doing this, I was taking extra courses and um going to California for spiritual emergence training for nine months. I would go one weekend a month and I I got certified in that so that um, we didn't have to classify somebody who was seeing their deceased person in their bedroom as crazy because spiritual emergence said that this happened. And when people do pass away in your family, especially people that you care about, um, it really does change you. And so that becomes a spiritual moment for you where you start to delve into, well, where are they? And, you know, where did they go and are they okay? So I started to do that work, that webinar recently um, because I teach um, on CEU.org and CHI um, different uh, social workers and psychologists that come and want to learn about uh, spirituality. Also, I think it's important to, um, Mention, I mentioned this to other social workers when I teach them that my clients coming from alcoholic and drug uh, experiences did have these spiritual experiences. So they were more interested in psychic experiences, I think, than the 
average client who would be coming to a social worker. And then I was more interested in it. Uh, and of course, I believe in past lives. So I, I think I probably was interested in it, you know, <laughs> eons ago somewhere. Um, so I hope I answered your question. You sure did. And thank you for taking the time to go through that and explain that with us. It's interesting. I often hear of people who are coming on that threshold of death, that they see their past dog or past loved one that is in the same room with them. You hear about these discussions happening quite often. Yes. And I I think my personal thought on that is, is that spirit? Well, yes, animals have spirits. They go um, to a place. uh, I don't know that they go to heaven, but but the one Robin Williams movie said, oh, I got in dog heaven by mistake. But um, they do go um, somewhere in a group soul. So um, you can see uh, your deceased animal. Absolutely. Just like you can see your deceased loved one. Now, of course, when you see them, when you see a person, their spirit, and a spirit gives you a feeling of the presence of a person. And also, they have an etheric body. And and that's something I try to teach people is that you have two bodies. You have a spiritual body and a physical body. And you, and you just need to accept that. Uh, but so how does that happen? Okay, so in utero, when you're conceived, an atom is placed there uh, that grows to be your spiritual body. That And that the purpose of your spiritual body is to contain your soul because your soul never dies. So you have to have some kind of a body to take it to the other side when your physical body dies here. Uh, so that's the two bodies. And St. Paul says that in the Bible. He said, we, we come in on the physical and we leave on the spiritual. And he, he was correct about that. Um, so, I mean, that would be the first thing to know. And then, um, then when your deceased person goes to the other side, they become a spirit. Um, so what does that mean? Well, they're confused because usually their religion hasn't said, well, when you go there, um, number one, when you leave your body, you're going to feel like, wow, what is all this about? Because because I'm still me and I can think. I'm still here. And because you still have your psyche, your conscious, your unconscious, and your mind. And so <clears throat> when you do leave the physical body in your spiritual body, you leave as atoms, molecules, protons, chemicals that goes up your vagus nerve out of the top of your head usually. And then you're in this etheric body, which is like a ghost-like body of you. So that if somebody saw it and they knew you, they could recognize that that is you. So um, now when the spirit's over there, just say, um, you know, they're deceased now, they're over there and they're confused because number one, um, if they try to come into your bedroom, their hand doesn't open the doorknob. Uh, They can't use their hands. Um, They don't walk. They kind of fly a little bit above the ground. And um, gravity doesn't affect a spiritual body. So you, you, you can't really stay on the ground. And um, you're there, but all you can do is just kind of show yourself if you have the ability to do that. Because some people that go to the other side don't have the vibrational level to come back right away and say, here I am and I'm okay. Some people stay over there you know, longer and have to let me see if their vibrations are low because they maybe they had a, a terrible death um, and maybe they committed suicide. Um, maybe they're just, you know, depressed here. So they're depressed there. Five minutes after you die, you are the same person on the other side as you were here. And um, so if you have good energy here, you're going to have better energy over there. And if you don't have better energy over there, then there are spiritual guides and angels um, who will um, help you. Uh, develop uh, the energy from the white light that's over there. They all talk about this beautiful light and the flowers. And it's it's really all nature on the other side, music, uh, just beautiful. And then their loved ones are waiting for them and they will help them also acclimate to here you are. Uh, you can't You can't do the things you can do on earth. And the only way you can contact people back on earth is through thought. So that's how we... We get to hear from them as we get thoughts. Now, one of the problems about us here on earth is we haven't been taught that when somebody passes away, they're going to give you thoughts. And so if you think about your aunt who just passed away, 
and you get a thought like maybe uh, music comes on the radio when you're in the car and it's her favorite song. Well, nobody's taught you that that could be her trying to reach you. So it's one of the things that I'm doing in this, where did they go and are they okay, is to try to teach people what it's like from the spirit aspect that they want to come back and say, hello, this is where I am now and I'm okay. And please stop crying because it isn't so bad. Uh, I left my body and I feel really free. Um, so that's what I'm trying to explain to people, the two bodies and then the two places where we both exist. Now, earlier you touched on the vagus nerve, but how do we, how does that compare and work with our spiritual selves? Okay. Well, the vagus is the 10th and longest nerve in your body. So your physical body, and it's a bi-directional system, which was discovered in the 1700s. It was called the pneumogastric nerve by Darwin. And what he said was, is that the stomach triggers the brain and the heart rate goes up. And that's exactly what happens. So one of the ways I learned about the vagus was that that would help people with panic and anxiety because they had these trigger thoughts um, or they hear, um, you know, a, a car backfire. And if they're a Vietnam vet, then it's post-traumatic stress and the brain says danger, danger, and, and their heart rate goes up and they're afraid they're going to be killed. So all of that <clears throat> is what the vagus nerve does for us, which isn't always a good thing. And so what I teach my clients or taught them, especially when I was learning first about it, is you have this nerve in your body and um, you can help it calm down, but it does trigger your brain from your stomach and then your heart rate goes up. And so if you have a panic attack in the car or if you're not breathing properly, um, you, you need to just pull over and do the vagus breath, which is you breathe in on the count of four and then you breathe out longer. So it doesn't matter how much longer because it's not our normal way of breathing. But, you know, so I can breathe into four and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now, because I practice that a lot, I practice it at night if I can't sleep. It just calms the body down. So that's what your vagus nerve is. It it really is uh, like a neurotransmitter that can calm you. And plus, what else does it do? It touches all the organs in your body somehow. And so it is um, very, very important for our physical life. Now, in our spiritual life, uh, there isn't that much written about this where they name it the vagus nerve. But from my research, your soul um, is in your solar plexus. Uh, that's where it's housed. It, well, it's in the physical body. And the vagus nerve is the channel, I believe, in which um, the soul leaves. Um, now, many people, men usually, uh, from 1929 um, through Robert Monroe in the 50s, um, these guys left their body. And so we know that people can do it. And they didn't leave it to have a spiritual experience, excuse me, like in a near death or where people see their loved ones in the light and all that. They just left their body kind of wandered around in space in there and um, came back in. So from what I have read, what happens to this vagus nerve is that when you are ready or your soul is ready to leave your body, and we can just say upon death now, what will happen is right around your ears, that's where the area is that um, it just automatically starts this uh, whirring noise. Um, that's what they say. I hear this whirring noise in my ears. And um, the energy there twists your body. And um, Robert Monroe explained it in 1977, like a wave comes over my body rhythmically, head to toe. And yes, that's what happens. And then there's vibration. So you have to understand that we all have different vibrational levels. So <clears throat> this etheric body that's made of molecules, protons, atoms, all that stuff um, gets ready to come up this vagus nerve and go out the top of your head. So first pe people hear the whirring sound and then there's a click. I believe that's where they're leaving the head or the pineal gland and the vibration is getting stronger and stronger. And so I have written about it um, like this, the energy in our body 
with the sum of rotating channels, that's, that's your chakra system, could wind its way up from the sacrum to the vagus in the middle of our sympathetic and parasympathetic sections of the nervous system. As chemicals are being released, pierce the center of one's skull where the mandula oblongata and the pineal gland open the top chakra, that's the clit, which would result in leaving one's body, expanding our consciousness with out-of-body experiences near death or when we actually die. So I hope that explains what the vagus nerve does spiritually. It does. Thank you. And thank you for going through that and explaining that. It's interesting. I, I, I know you've done so much research in the work that you do and have really dived into just how this all comes together. When you're doing your research, was there anything that really surprised you? Uh, well, what surprised me is that um, your physical body can change into an etheric body. I mean, that's like, you know, something out of the movies, right? And and then you can leave. Uh, but it did, it does explain a lot of things, you know, that you were taught as a kid in like in Sunday school and what the Bible says can happen. Because um, how do we get there? <laughs> and I think I always tried to explain people with Jungian psychology, what Carl Jung meant about the unconscious. And I felt that my clients got got better and tried harder because I would explain the unconscious and the steps in the unconscious. And this is how we're going to get to material, not all of it, but material you've repressed. And and it worked. So I thought to myself, somehow I have to explain to them how they get out of this body and get to the other side. So that was the biggest thing, I think. So when we look at our loved ones that pass, how do we know that they're really okay? Well, the best way, I think, Well, the best way is if they can come and show themselves to you in your family room or your your living room, but um, they don't all do that. So then we should go to a medium. And that's what William James, the father of American psychology said. Um, He studied mediumship. He and Carl Jung both studied it, Um, but we don't get taught that in social work school. Um, But he called them mental healers, these mediums. And the reason he and his wife went to a medium was because they lost a toddler, a little boy. And of course, Mrs. James wanted to know where her son was. And um, at that time in Massachusetts, um, I guess the the story is that some of the maids were going to mediums. And so they gave her some names and she went. And um, then she found Mrs. Piper, who was William James's favorite medium. She was very, very accurate. And she got Miss William James to go with her. And then he, he was personally interested in the subject because he had lost a son. And um, and Carl Jung was personally interested because his mother was psychic and his grandfather. So, but this isn't told when you go to college. And I think it should be because they really, they wanted to know from the heart what was happening. Um, and that's a wonderful thing I think that happens. It increases your love when you can know that your loved one is still there. Uh, so many people are afraid to go to a medium because it's against their religion or they're weird people. And, and some of them are weird people, you know, like all the rest of us. But um, so William James said the best way to know about a medium reading, reading is to go. And he was right. And then when you go and they tell you some things. Now, mediums are usually the best mediums are up to 85 percent accurate. Um So, but most mediums that I've gone to or psychics, now you go to a psychic if you want to find your keys or where your grandmother hid the money in the attic. Um, And you go to a medium if you want to talk to your grandmother. So there's a little difference there. Although sometimes the psychic does the same thing as a medium. So that would be, you'd have to check that out when you call the person, just like you would check out a therapist as to what kind of modality do you use? Um, And, you know, where can you help? So, so that's what I try, I'm trying to do is to get therapists to understand that mediums are kind of like they are. No, well, number one, because they study, just like we study. There's the Arthur Finley College in England, and they go there. That's the best place, they say. And then they can go to Lilydale, which is a town in um, near Lake Erie, and they, can, they take courses all summer there. Uh, you go to Casadega near, near Disneyland in Florida. You can take classes there. 
And you can take classes in any spiritualist church. Uh, and spiritualism is a religion, um, like a Protestant religion, which believes that um, they believe in life after death and that love is continued uh, when you can keep in contact uh, with your loved one. When we're connecting with mediums, it's really to connect with our loved ones on the other side and get that reassurance that they're okay and they're they're in places where we would want them to be. Yes, yes, that's why we will. Or I send I don't send them. I strongly suggest they go. I mean, I had this one gentleman, and um, I always tell a story. And he, uh, he came down for breakfast and his wife was, you know, dead on the kitchen floor, which is a big shock. And um, he had two teenage boys to, to raise, which he had no idea how to do that. And so he came to me for months and months and months and we were doing grief and parenting skills. And I said, you know, this chronic grief is, is not leaving. And I really would like you to go to a medium. Now, I had lucked out because his sister-in-law had gone to a medium and I happened to have had her as a client. And she called me, said she knew where her sister was. and. So I said, she doesn't have very much grief, does she? No, because she knows where your wife is and um, and she's fine with it, you know, and she can talk to her if she wants to or go to a medium or pray to her or, and that makes her happy. So I really would like you to go to a medium because I think number one, it would just really help our work move along because you are stuck in this grief. And a lot of people are stuck in, um, you know, feeling guilty for what I didn't do enough, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think especially men, at least this guy was guilty about all the things he didn't do right as a husband. And uh, but I didn't say that. I said that a little bit, but you can't really push that. Um, Anyway, he went. Oh, I was so relieved. Well, when he came back, he walked in my office and his shoulders were different. I mean, the guy guy was so relaxed. And I told him, we can't guarantee your wife's going to come in. But you lost your parents last year. Uh, 18 months ago, you lost an aunt and uncle you really loved. I said, so somebody will come in and they'll tell you what's going on. But she came in and uh, and all those other people came too. So, I mean, he really got a great reading. And uh, she told him about her boys and which one he needed to be more concerned about than the other one. And um, she told him it wasn't his fault. It was a complete heart attack. And um, so his guilt was com- you know completely gone when he came back. and. Uh, and he said, but I'm not going again. I said, no, I don't want you to go again. One, is, one time is enough as long as you know where she is. Yeah, I do know where she is now. And then one of the things I think they should ask uh, when they're with the medium is ask their loved one, how would you like to communicate with me when I go home? So because I think people don't ask that. And then they, when they get home, they, they think, well, I mean, you can always go back to a medium. Um, but You can also, um, you know, through dreams, uh, through writing, through intuitive thought, you can, if you really can, you know, meditate and concentrate, you can, you can get thoughts from uh, your deceased loved one too. So you can do it yourself. But our therapy just really moved. And that's really when I decided, you know, I have to start, number one, getting a medium list, finding some mediums in the area that, you know, I trust and some people I trust, trust. And, um, and we did that. And, you know, it's, it's worked out really well because people grow after that. And, and the spirituality groups that I ran when I was getting my doctorate, a lot of those people went to mediums. And it was almost like what they would tell me was, um, you know, after therapy, you still want more. And this is more because you're getting the, the spiritual aspect of, of your life. Of course, they were all you know, past probably 40 and 50 too. So they were really interested in in that part um, of where do we go and uh, where am I going to go, you know? So they want to learn it. Do you find it helps a lot of therapists understand in in a more profound way of, of how grief really works in many ways? Yes, um, I do. <laughs> Except what I'm finding too is, God bless all of us because we're so rational sometimes. And uh, so it's like learning another language to learn about mediums. Because I, I remember like a couple of weeks ago, I got a question of, well, how often how often during a month would they come back? <laughs> well, now, 
what I explained before that was your loved one, love is the, the greatest energy of all. So the ones that are going to want to come back and connect with you are the ones that can really show their love and make that connection. Now, I want to say that the spirit on the other side has to have control of their energy in order to really come back to you. And so if they come back fast, like within a few weeks, and you you know, you know see them in your bedroom or you get thoughts of them and you get smells, you know, the after death communication where you get all these different clues that, hey, they it seems like they're around me. Well, that means they have good energy, clear energy. So <clears throat> when they come to visit you, it's because, number one, they love you. Um, they might think that you're suffering too much and crying too much. And they think if they can tell you where they are, that you'll be you'll be better. Uh, they might have some unfinished business that they want to tell you things um, that, uh, you know, they never got to tell you. Um, and and maybe, you know, they just want to tell you where they are, just like if we go on vacation. You know, we want to call our loved ones and say, hey, it's really great here. You know, I really like the beach and all that stuff. Um, so that's what happens anyway. They they want to reach you, I think, sometimes as much as you want to reach them. And especially the people on, on Earth, because there's so many people that, that grieve too long um, and really have a hard time like that gentleman getting on with their life. Well, I can understand that when you have a, a dear loved one that's passed, it feels like it's easy to get stuck um, in that place of just profound grief and mm -hmm. being able to have tools to work through that. I mean, how profound is that? Really? Yeah. So with the work that you're doing, I would think that it also would help enlighten and just kind of expand the discussion for many social workers and mental health professionals of when people are having a spiritual experience, uh, that's probably something to consider as opposed to everything is a mental illness. That's right. And the difference between um, a mental illness and spirit, a spiritual experience is that if a person has is ha had had a spiritual experience and they come into your office and they just might explain that, I don't know what happened to me. It was really weird, but I got this real sense of, love and peace on the beach or whatever um that humbles them and and they can come in and out of whatever story they have at any time and keep telling you that story and they are humbled if somebody's in a psychotic break or having psychosis like schizophrenia they are grandiose and they can say well i i talked to god i, I talked to jesus last night and they can go on and on but they can't go back to this, that story again and again, because the story will continually change. Now, if you have somebody in a psychotic break who tells a part of a story that always stays the same, then you know that a psychotic person or a person having a psychotic break has had a part, has had some part of spiritual experience. But that almost takes a, you know, a few people on the team because these people are usually hospitalized to realize the difference um, between psychosis and a spiritual experience. Because like if we take somebody with a near death, it takes people with a near death experience when they leave their body, go up and they, uh, about 25% of them have a spiritual experience of seeing their loved ones and lo the light and everything. When they come back, um, it takes them about seven years to come tell you anything. That's a long time. And and they have near death people have seventy nine percent divorce rate after they have the near death because their whole perception of life and death has changed. They've been there, come back, and um, they know well, death is nothing to be afraid of. And and their values change. They want different things. So you have a guy who dies and comes back, and then he's you know I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. You know I think I I want to be a counselor. So like, what? Um, and I just want to help people. And, and so then the wife is unhappy. And I can't believe that you think that you had this experience because they don't understand. So a lot of family members, you know, need to be educated also so that this 79% divorce rate can go down. But the values completely change when you've had a spiritual experience. 
You just want different things. And mostly what you want is to have better relationships in life. And they don't know how they're going to get them necessarily, uh, but they want better relationships. It seems we're in this great time in history where there are so many people that are having near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, and spiritual experiences that the discussion for this has really elevated. Absolutely. And um, I know that um, you know about this, but um, a lot of people don't know that the Bigelow Institute of Consciousness Studies in Las Vegas had uh, started a research project in 2021 where they asked um, for researchers uh, to give evidence for life after death and proof that would satisfy a court of law. And um, somebody sent me a New York Times article about it. Karen, this sounds like something you would like. So I applied. There's 1,300 people that applied for the application. And um, then, like, that was in February, January, February. And in November 1st, um, or no, August 20th, you had to write a 25,000 word essay if you wanted to um, you know, give them your opinion of what was proof of life after death. And then they announced 29 winners on November 1st. And the first prize gentleman was Jeffrey Mishlove. And he had um, had a PBS show where he interviewed a lot of people about quantum physics and different types of spirituality. And he received uh, $500,000 for the first prize. Because every reference practically in this paper was a video. <laughs> so that was the best paper I'd ever read. And um, but they gave they gave a million to two two million dollars in a this juried essay contest to winners um, of the 29 papers. And I really commend Mr. Bigelow for doing that because um, I hope that it's really going to add to a lot of people understanding that these things do happen. And that's the feedback I've gotten in the webinars I've given that um, this is real. You know, if a billionaire is willing to pay money, um, number one, and then people are writing um, and they keep explaining how a near-death happens over and over the same pattern. It really is natural uh, because it is what happens when you die, the near-death. And um, and then those people that have near-death when they come back, they're so happy. Uh, if you go to a near-death conference of near-deathers, they're like, they're the happiest people around. Because they don't, Freud was right. People are afraid of death. And maybe that's why it's so difficult for them to get, you know, on the bandwagon here with out of body and near death. And maybe they're just afraid to even look at it sometimes, you know. I can understand that. I have a few friends that don't even like talking about the subject of death. Yes. So yeah. being able to expand on our consciousness, our spirit, and where that goes when we do leave this physical body can be really difficult for people sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, let's not talk about it. <laughs> no, let's not talk about it. Do you, do you think that there have been ancient practices all along and we're just in the West a little slow on the take here for understanding how death is just this natural progression of our life and that there's something after this? Yes, because we're so rational and materialistic. Plus, nobody's ever talked really about the metaphysical systems that are around us. So you and I are speaking today and in the sensory world where there's a past, present, and future, and everything is solid here, but, you know, where I am and where you are. And so there's the sensory metaphysical world, and that's the world we all live in. Then there's the metaphysical world of the clairvoyance. And that's the um, the world where the mediums and psychics live, where clairvoyantly they hear and see and smell things that we don't necessarily. Now, we get a little bit of that clairvoyance when we, we, we develop our intuition. And that's what I see as uh, really helping people. The more they can understand about these signs that spirit sends us, the more they will develop their intuition. And that would be really healthy. But in the clairvoyant world, it's just now. And and um, just to understand that, uh, and when you read these different stories about uh, the different near-death um, uh, things that people have had, they've just been there. 
It's not past, present, or future. They're there. And it only happens to one person at a time. So there's not a lot of people that can prove that she or he, you know, actually left their body. And because you have to be, number one, clairvoyant to see this etheric body leave and go out of the top of your head. So um, I don't know how many people are having a near death or out of body that are clairvoyant, not very many. And there's no clairvoyant people standing around. Like one of the things I would love to find is a clairvoyant electrical engineer because they would be able to tell us what happens um, with this going up the vagus nerve and et cetera, et cetera. But number, number two, my point is that we do have this clairvoyant place. Now, how do just a normal person, how do we get to know about the clairvoyant? Well, number one, you could go to a medium or a psychic. And when you're there, you're just in the now. It's just, I mean, you're there and you're having a good time. And and when you and when you leave, you feel good, right? And then I remember leaving once and um going home and thinking, do you feel so happy when you leave her? Now I'd gone to the psychic maybe. Oh, maybe three times in maybe five years. And I thought, you know, Karen, she doesn't always tell you everything that's going to happen, you know, correctly. No. But so how come you're so happy? I don't know. But, I, you know, it's just what I do. No, I don't smoke or drink that much. So I don't smoke at all. So this is what I do. I go to psychics or mediums. And um, but then I learned about this clairvoyant place called now. And so you have your astrology chart read. Uh, you go for um, I, I Ching reading, you have tarot cards, all those things that you do that people say, don't do those things. They put you in the now. Now, I'm sure I've had, I've gone in the now gardening or seeing a grandchild or, you know, there's lots of times that we're just there. But that is a special meta metaphysical place. Then... <clears throat> There's a third place where miracles happen and where people are transformed. And one of the, um, that's a metaphysical system. I forget right now what that's called, but doctors have said, um, one research paper I read, 55% of doctors have seen miracles. So miracles happen and people get better with no intervention and we don't know why. So those are the three metaphysical systems that are constantly flowing around us. I, and I think if people could learn that, those three systems, that you have two bodies, um, and that the vagus helps you on earth and also is a bi-directional system, you know, when you leave your body. Um, if they could just get that, maybe then we could start, you know, to really talk about some things and not have so many people blank out or, um, you know, just resist completely. Yeah, have them get into this fearful space yes. when it's a part, you know, death is a part of living. You know, it's a process that we all go through. And that all of these things surrounding death and and talking to your loved ones and um, it's all a mystery. I mean, as much as I can explain to you, there's still mystery about so much of it. And I don't think people are comfortable with that. Um, I believe that there's a God because I had a spiritual experience of where I felt God. And so I know there's a God. So that mystery, I just know it. Now, I think a lot of people, especially the people that come to a therapist, um, yes, they go to church and they pray, but I don't know how much they really believe that there's a plan. And so when I start to get nervous about things, I think, wait a minute, you're not in charge anyway. So, you know, what can you do right now? And one of the things you won't do is to panic or have anxiety about it because you're not in control. And I can do that now and know I don't have to be in control. But I think a lot of people with the egos that people have in a materialistic society, they, they feel like they have to be in control. And they don't like a mystery part. Well, it's a mystery part and a part that we'll never be in control of, you know, because <laughs> we don't know when it's going to happen. And, you know, it could be peaceful in our sleep or in other ways, you know? Yes. Right. Right. So when you do, I know you've got these amazing courses that you do 
that really help people to understand how spirituality isn't a really foreign thing. It really is part of our psychology. What is one of the things that you teach in your courses that you really think people maybe just don't know? Well, that they they don't know that two very famous psychologists that are taught in universities around the world, William James and Carl Jung, believed in spirituality and believed in a consciousness around us at all times. And um, I don't know that that Jung would have called it, well, yeah, Jung probably would have called it God. Um, It doesn't have to be God because some people don't believe in God. So you just believe in this universal energy of nature that nature happens over and over again. It has a pattern. And that is what happens to us spiritually. There's a pattern for our lives. And I believe that, as Jung did, that when you are born, you have a soul purpose for coming here. And so he said that our job was to discover our soul purpose. And so, first of all, though, I think what you find out in life is what you don't want. And you find out the mistakes that you made that you shouldn't have made. And now you've got to get out of this mess. But guess what? That develops your soul. Um, so number one, number three or four would be knowing you have a soul and that it has a purpose. And then I believe that spiritual experiences that people have are really made from their soul. So if like, if you take mine, I had a breath come through me that I took me two years to figure out it was the Holy spirit. But so my father was Protestant. My mother was Catholic. So really, I got a spiritual experience that would fit both of those because I just felt the Holy Spirit. So I didn't have any conflict with that. Not that I would have had religiously anyway, because, you know, I, I kind of um, I, I've been baptized both Protestant and both Catholic at, this, at different times and decided I'm just spiritual. That's what I really feel more comfortable being and trying to live the golden rule. Um, but I think everybody really probably has the ability to have a spiritual experience. And the one you're going to have is the one that fits your soul purpose. Okay. Well, now you talked about soul purpose. So how do we know what our soul purpose is? Oh, yeah. Well, it takes a long time to figure it out. And uh, I think one of the things that helped me is that I have my astrology chart read every year. She tells me, you have 12 houses in astrology. They they stand for all different things that you can imagine, just 12 different areas of your life. And, um, and she'll tell me, you know, money will be hard here, or you're going to have a fight with a woman here, or blah, 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 just different things. And it's not all specific things like that, because she talks a lot about astrology. And I write it all down. And probably the only thing I, I know is I don't like Saturn return. And anybody that knows astrology will will laugh at that because nobody wants a Saturn return because that means you're going to have trouble of some kind. But um, that helps me. Also, what helped me was when I got divorced and um, I went to the women's center at local college and I said, I'm going to get divorced. And um, because my husband's an alcoholic, he doesn't want any help. And I don't know if I should just go to work because I was a secretary or should I go back to college? So they put me in this room with um, all these pictures of women, big conference room. And I sat there and they gave me this file and it had like an inch worth of papers in the file. And so my first question was, if you had all the time and all the money in the world, what would you do? So I put, go to college. And then you spent 45, or I spent 45 minutes answering all those other questions. And then it said, the last thing, said, go to question number one and do it anyway. So that gave me permission to go to college. I had no idea how I was going to do that. But I said, okay, all right. Now, maybe, you know, that sounds gullible or I was too innocent. But I was, you know, at my wit's end. I got three girls here. What am I going to do? And blah, blah, blah. And so that was some direction. And astrology is giving me direction. A prayer, meditation gives you direction. Um. Learning to live calmer, you know, because you the soul words, you know, are love and empathy and all those lovely things that we idealize, but we don't necessarily live. 
And so you start living like that um, more so. But you get direction in your life from, like I said before, from the things that you found out you didn't want to do. And um, and I think I was supposed to be a therapist. Um, so I, you know, I got an AA degree, I got a bachelor's degree, I got a master's degree. And then eventually after my spirit experience, spiritual experience, I thought, these people are coming to me with all these experiences. I had one. There's got to be a lot of people out there that have had them. So I'm going to study them. So I decided to get a PhD. And so then you have to investigate how you're going to do that. Stay in New Jersey because you have a private practice. And um, so I went to an educational consultant. I went to Union Institute in um, Cincinnati. I could have moved to San Francisco. There was a one college there that would have given me what I wanted. But um, I couldn't I couldn't leave my practice because that's how I was going to pay for this Ph.D. And uh, so then they said, you know, they give you five PhDs and you can pick as many PhDs as you want. So I asked Raymond Moody and he said yes. And so I had him as a consultant and uh, it was wonderful because I read everything he ever wrote. And you know what I learned from him, too, was pre-digression. And that's the purpose of the paranormal. I think more people need to know that, that paranormal is gives a purpose. So so I. He had this in his book, The Last Laugh, which I think is his best book. It's funny. And it's the only one the publisher didn't change. So anyway, in Last Laugh, he talks about pre-digression, where things, um, information comes up um, from the paranormal at times when you need it, and usually has something to do with mental illness. And I'm not describing it very well. It was written in more technical terms. And so I asked Raymond, you know, what is this pre-digression thing? And he gave me a nice educational answer, which didn't satisfy me. So I was running a spirituality group at the time. And it was after Christmas, January. And people came back uh, after vacation. And there was this one girl, woman, that um, she was uh, born on Wednesday. And her family had said Wednesday's child is full of woe. And she had grown up with that. And she was very depressed. And so the group said, anytime you get depressed, uh, you have to meditate. So she had tried everything, tea and a long walk and all this stuff. And then she decided, all right, I'll sit down and I'll meditate. So she meditated and she said she had this vision of the three kings. And they came to her and they gave, put, put these gifts at her feet. And they were very happy to see her. And she said that her self-esteem just rose from the three kings um, coming to her. And um, after the meditation, she was just fine. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's pre-digression right there. So I was so happy that she brought me that example because she had mental illness, she had depression. And then her, um, her knowledge of, of religion, because she was Catholic, um, the three kings are very important. And I, if I could ever find this in my notes, because I probably have those notes somewhere. I bet it was on the Three Kings Day that she had this meditation. That would be my gut feel from everything I know now. And uh, and so, you know, I told her, you know, I got lots of Christmas cards. So I want you to make a collage of the Three Kings and keep that somewhere, you know, uh, in your in your office or your bedroom or wherever, because um, that was that's very important spiritual experience that you had. So old knowledge will come. And it has to do with your soul development. And these things, you know, we don't get a sign that says soul development happens on Wednesday. It just comes up and then you need to know, oh, this is really important. And, and you will know that because like she felt that. And, um, and I felt like there was a God and that I was connected to all these people at the conference who I had thought were kind of weird <laughs> when I started with them. And I knew we were all connected to everybody on earth. So I knew. And so, you know, after I studied for a couple of years and knew Bill Wilson of AA, he had had a breath come through him. And once I read that and it was um, not of air, but of spirit, I thought, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. So I hope to help people. So they have to wait two years or seven years um, and and make it so that therapists will ask, you know, some of the right questions that will help people feel more comfortable 
Well, thank you, Dr. Karen. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work? Well, they can um, come on my website, which is Karen, K-R-E-N-E, Herrick, H-E-R-R-I-C-K dot com. And um, I, I, I don't mind um, answering emails at all. Um, so that's Karen at KarenHerrick.com is my email address. Um, that would be the, the two best ways. Well, Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Karen. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Where Did They Go and Are They Okay? I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.